Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming in here. My name is Vishal Verma. I'm a performance engineer at Intel. I am mostly focused on storage I.O. performance while working at Intel. And I have my colleague, John Karyuki, working as a storage application engineer. So today we are going to talk about the, the, the new kernel feature called I.O. Euring and its performance. So what the agenda for today? We're going to do some background study on a uh, little bit on uh, current I.O. interfaces. And then what's this I.O. Euring, the new interfaces, little high level details. And then we're going to talk about some um, how to use, as an application developer, how to use I.O. Euring using the, there's a library developed by Ens, Jens. Uh, it's called Lib Euring. And then uh, John is going to talk about some of the performance analysis we did using I.O. Euring and its comparison to uh, in kernel like uh, AIO and, uh, and other I.O. interfaces, including SPDK. All right. So when, when we talk about the existing Linux kernel interfaces, we know there's a category. Um, basically, there is synchronous I.O. interfaces and async I.O. interfaces within the kernel. So when it comes to synchronous interfaces, uh, a thread starts an I.O. operation. It submits a request, and then it just waits until the, the completion is pretty much done. So it's, it's blocking in nature. And normally, the examples of these system calls in the kernel are read and write. These are pretty old, um, and they are out there for basic read-write operations. And then with the advancement, there is p-read, p-write, with some features like uh, offsets in place. And then there are other extensions to p-read, p-write with p-read v, p-write v, p-read v2, and write v2. All of these are synchronous I.O. interfaces within the kernel. And then there is a category of async interfaces, where a thread, a thread sends an I.O. request to the kernel, and it it's continues to do uh, its own work. And then at certain point, the completion thread tells the actual submission thread that the I.O. is finished. So these scenarios are pretty much like non-blocking in nature. And when it comes to Linux kernel like POSIX, there is AIO read, AIO write, which supports async mechanisms. And with Linux AIO, uh, that's a pretty common AIO interface, uh, which is predominantly used. And then there is always this uh, user space I.O. interfaces, like what are the examples of? So SPDK, it's, uh, it's a set of tools and libraries implemented in user space. It's highly scalable and user mode driven. It supports async, pole mode, and lockless designs. So, so that's the user space interface. And if somebody wants to check it, like on SPDK, there is this uh, spdk.io. To, to get more information on that. But our talk is going to focus on the kernel I.O. interface. OK, so we'll dive into some overhead problem that which is in the current Linux kernel when we talk about the performance, especially for the low latency media, especially if you look at the, the latest uh, Intel Optane SSD, the P4800. It's, it's really, um, the latency levels are in microseconds. And when you start using these different I.O. interfaces, you try to compare, you know, for a single queue depth, what's my average uh, completion time when you send your request until it gets back from, from your media. So what this graph is saying, uh, we have this relative latency. So we, we baseline our numbers based on PV sync 2, which supports uh, polling in the kernel. And that is supposed to be really fast. And we, we can see that other interfaces, like libAIO, PV sync, V sync, all of them have a lot of uh, overhead compared to PV sync 2. And that's just an example of when you, you're running a 4K, a simple 4K random read request with a Q depth of 1. So you can see there is an overhead of more than 30% in, in this scenario. 
so that was a simple use case but what about you have um, multiple queue depths in in your application um, when there is a single thread it's submitting multiple at once like maybe uh, when you start scaling the queue depth from 2 to 4 to 8 until it gets to something like 256 so we took a drive uh, a 3d nand intel p p4610 uh, drive which can support up to 500k or even um, more than that 600k iops uh, per thread and we were looking at you know if you scale your queue depth how the iops behave so if you look your um, on the horizontal axis uh, all of those lines are overlapping so it's not very like from the coloring is not very clear but all of these uh, synchronous interfaces you see there is a flat line so they tend to not scale with more q depths but if you look at there is a light green line or i say light blue line which is an uh, lib aio and because it's a asynchronous interface it's pretty clear that you know with more q depth you start seeing more iops and uh, that's for a single thread use case so what the overhead problem here is you know you have um, a trade off where if you want your very limited ios versus you want like very high throughput but there is always this overhead problem we we have in the linux kernel especially for the the upcoming low latency drives so how so what's what's there like what can be done on the kernel like is there anything new so that's where this io uring the new io interface which is starting to be part of the Linux kernel since 5.1 kernel release. And so what is IO Uring? So it's a high IO performance and scalable um, interface. It supports zero copy, where you know your submission queue and completion queue, they are basically accessing a, a shared memory. There's no uh, um, extra copy involved. Basically, you have your, um, your process you, you get a file descriptor from a, when you create an IO Uring uh, instance, and then you basically MAP your um, process into this. You MAP those uh, completion queue and submission queue buffers into the process address space, so then the application can directly talk to the kernel without any locking in place. And, and that allows you to have zero copy and Another thing, another cool feature of IO Ring, it's lockless. It's completely lockless. It's supposed um, single producer, single consumer type of ring buffers. So when an application is sending a request, it's like a, it's producing, it's a producer ring, and, on the, and while submitting, the kernel is the consumer. And whereas on the completion side, the kernel is actually producing and the application is uh, receiving or consuming. So, so that allows it to be pretty lockless. There's no locking involved. <laughs> and IO Uring also supports batching, which is, you know, with, with batching, you, you tend to eliminate your system call overhead. So it's pretty efficient in terms of per IO overhead. And one of the features for AIO, it, was, it is uh, asynchronous, but it supports async with ODirect flag where you bypass your page cache. So, so this mechanism allows async IOs even like without requiring that ODirect support. And, and it supports block, uh, file IO, and also socket IO. Um, it, it operates in you know, the interrupt and poll mode IO. So a user can basically choose depending on how he wants to like, he or she wants to access the, uh, the underlying IO. It can be interrupted or the pole mode. So we'll we'll talk about some performance uh, results. What we have discovered, and um, when it comes to actually using this um, I/O Uring, there is this lib Uring library. Um, when an application developer he wants to like start using this um, I/O Uring interface, so so what happens is you know this. This liburing library, it, it allows different APIs. So first of all, a user would initialize the queues. There are a few examples like IO Uring queue init, 
which basically you know sets an IO during instance and it creates a communication and it gives you a file descriptor where your application can map and it can directly talk to the uh, kernel. And so that's for the initialization of the queue and similarly there is IO during queue exit which removes the uh, IO during instance. And what about the submission? So, so there are a few examples of uh, when an IO has to submit. There's IO during get C SQE, uh, prep read V, prep write V, and then the actual submit where you are actually sending your commands to the kernel for consumption. So that was the submission part, and and there is always this completion. So there are distinct, uh, you know, the APIs for IO during wait CQ. So that is for when you have submitted a request, how to retrieve it from the kernel. So there is wait CQ and peak CQ. The basic difference between the two is for wait CQ, you have to actually wait until the CQ is finished. Whereas with peak CQ, you're just taking a look at peaking at the submission, the completion queue ring, and it's, it doesn't wait for the event to complete. And there is IO during CQ is seen, which basically says, okay, once the IO is complete, uh, CQ ring head you know increments, and it allows kernel to fill in a new event. Um, and if somebody wants to look at uh, the, the more features for Liburing, uh, we have this link um, from uh, Jens under GitHub to to look at you know what are the different features of Liburing. Okay, so uh, to summarize, you know, the we talked about a little bit on the interfaces and like synchronous interfaces, libAIO, IO Uring. So how do they compare? So whenever you are uh, submitting or completing an IO, basically the overheads are categorized into system call, memory copy, and context switches. So they really they are really the the main you know performance choke points when you're uh, submitting and completing an IO. So for sync, AI, sync IO, uh, for system call, it has to be at least one IO for like one system call for every IO. Whereas for lib IO, how the APIs work, it has to be two per, per IO. Uh, whereas for IO Uring, which is new, which is uh, pretty efficient, it allows you to bundle your IOs into a batch and then you can just submit one IO. So it, uh, so you can say that it's, it has one system call for whatever batch size you want. And also in IO Uring there is a SQ kernel thread. It's a submission thread, which basically would allow no system call at all. So that's a pretty cool feature um, with IO Uring. When it comes to memory copy, it, as I said earlier, it supports zero copy, and it's pretty efficient compared to sync and lib IO interfaces. Context switching is minimal. Um, you have this polling in place with IO Uring, so, so you don't have to, um, the, it supports both interrupt and polling, but with polling there would be minimal context switching. Uh, you don't have to go back and forth uh, between user and kernel space. And of course, it's, uh, it's asynchronous, so it's uh, blocking, when it comes to blocking IO. Blocking IO is, yeah, you are waiting for the completion. Well, um, so it supports completely async, even for uh, buffered I.O., which is, it supports buffered I.O. as well, compared to lib I.O. So those are the main you know, trade-offs between I.O. Uring and why it is efficient. And now we are gonna look at, based on these uh, background, what kind of performance results we see when we run I.O. Uring. Uh, so John will uh, walk you through those data. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Vishal. So we're going to be uh, looking at uh, some performance data that uh, we collected, um, comparing IO Uring uh, versus Libe IO, uh, and also some comparisons with uh, with SPDK. So this first uh, uh, chat that we're looking at here. Um, we were just trying to understand the maximum IOPS that you can get on a single call. So uh, standard Intel Xeon system, uh, 
Cascade Lake uh, Platinum SKU is the, the CPU on this system. And uh, um, what's interesting with the uh, IOU ring is there's a couple of different tricks that you can play to get better performance. Uh, and what we're showcasing in this graph is, uh, so with IOU ring, uh, right out of the box, without trying uh, a whole lot, we were able to get a million IOPS on, uh, on a single call. Actually, it's, it's about 1.2 million IOPS uh, on a single call. Uh, and then we start applying the techniques of batching, and we see that performance go up uh, and peak at about 1.9 million IOPS um, on a single CPU call. The, the, the really interesting thing with batching, at least for us when we looked at this graph, is you often wonder with batching how effective, right? how, how big do your batches need to be in order for you to effectively see a significant increase in your performance. Uh, and as you can see in this graph, uh, you, you don't actually have to try much, right? At, at about batch sizes of four, uh, you're already seeing significant improvement in the, in the throughput in IOPS per core. And by the time you get to about a batch size of eight, you're already at about 1.8 million IOPS. So uh, batching techniques, pretty effective, even, even at tiny batches, you still get noticeable performance improvements. You can batch for AIO also, um, and that, that improves the performance a little bit, right? Um, with AIO, that peaked at about 900K IOPS. Yes? That's a good question. So uh, all the performance data we'll be looking at is IOU ring in polling mode, no interrupts. And we actually have a slide later that shows uh, uh, the number of interrupts when we turned, when, when we turned on uh, IOU ring with polling. It's a good question. So now that uh, we knew the kind of bells and whistles we needed to turn on in order to uh, get the best performance, uh, we turned on those bells and whistles and we said, okay, let's run uh, Libe IO and see what is the maximum IOPS we get on a single CPU call. Uh, once again, that's about 900K IOPS. Uh, with IOU ring, that goes up, it doubles, right? So that maximum IOPS per call doubles to about 1.9 million IOPS. Um, and in case you're wondering what happens uh, with SPDK, right? Uh, so the key difference, a couple of key differences between IOU ring and SPDK, they're both polling, one's in user space with a few more tricks. Uh, so with SPDK, we see about another 5.5x 5, 5 uh, increase in the number of, in the, in the IOPS per call. So the, the other side of the performance is the latency side, right? So if you're writing an application that is latency sensitive uh, and you're looking at uh, these different IO engines uh, and how well do they, uh, um, uh, how efficient are they in terms of the software overhead to submit and complete an I.O.? Um, uh, that's what this slide here is trying to show. So we measured uh, just the software overhead to submit an I.O. That's what that blue bar is, the blue portion of the bar, and just the software overhead uh, to complete an I.O. So we are, not, we are not including the drive uh, latency here. It's just pure software overhead to submit an I.O. Uh, and complete an I.O. So when we start with the Lib I.O., uh, we see submission latency, sub software submission latency of about 1.5 microseconds, uh, and the completion latency uh, is about 0 0.5 uh, microseconds. We go to I.O. Uring, uh, and we apply uh, another trick here uh, called using fixed buffs. And what this trick does is it allows, to, uh, it allows the application to pre-register your I.O. buffers. Uh, that way they are not being uh, mapped, in your, mapped in your submission path and unmapped in your completion path. So we get that overhead to map and unmap your I.O. buffers out of your path. Um, and when we do that, we see a submission and completion latency uh, that totals at, at about 800. Uh, nanoseconds. So uh, that software overhead, right, to submit and complete the I.O. dropped by about 60 percent. And then as far as SPDK goes, uh, with SPDK, that overhead to submit and complete an I.O., uh, the software overhead is only about 300 nanoseconds. So 
it's about another 60% lower than what you're seeing with the IOU ring. So the next thing we did is um, we just wanted to look at the uh, traces, right? As, as we're running FIO, doing a 4K random read workload at QDepth1, uh, just look at the traces as we submit the IOs uh, and as we complete the IOs. Uh, just kind of see what the difference is, how, how different do they look. So this is the AIO, uh, lib AIO trace, right? So when FIO submits that IO, uh, there's a system call, uh, the IO submit system call uh, that, is, that is made. And uh, eventually that goes into uh, the, the AIO read method, which calls the block layer. And then to complete the I.O., uh, there's a system call, I.O. get events that is submitted to complete the I.O. by F.I.O. Uh, and, and eventually that does a read, does an A.I.O. read from the block layer to complete that I.O. And then as far as uh, Uring goes, uh, the submission and completion, like Vishal said, is all in one system call, right? So there's one system call, it's called the uh, I.O. Uring enter, uh, and that system call submits the I.O., right? It goes uh, into this I.O. Uring submit, uh, SQE, and that submits the I.O. eventually to the block layer. And then that same system call pulls the block layer for completion, right? Uh, uh, the, 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 that goes through that, that method, that I.O. pull get events method to pull the block layer for completions. So, um, I think there's some of the data you were asking. So looking at um, what's actually happening on the hardware side in terms of interrupts, as, as we go from uh, uh, LibIO in an asynchronous uh, interrupt-driven mode to IOU ring, uh, which is asynchronous but pulling inside the kernel. So basically what we saw is as far as the hardware interrupts goes, uh, those were completely eliminated, right, for uh, IOU ring. The, the uh, engine is pulling, so there are no hardware interrupts being generated uh, to get those completions from uh, the device. And then what this means in terms of context switches, right, which is another one of those key sources of software overhead, right, when you're, when you're trying to uh, talk to these devices that have that very high IOPS, right, is almost completely, completely eliminated, right? It's 99% reduction in context switches. That's, so the unit here is, what is the unit of the 251 I'm, I'm sorry, say that one more time. On the IOU ring, uh -huh. it's like the operator interrupt is 251.8. What's the unit? Uh, that's just the total count. Total count? Yeah, total count in 60 seconds. So it's, it's not really, they, they really, as far as I.O., when this system is silent, we probably see about that many hardware interrupts. So they have 0.8 of operator Exactly, exactly. So that is, I, I mean, I know we try to uh, collect without running any, any IOs on this system. The number was pretty close. It wasn't quite 250 per minute, but for all intent purposes, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the conclusion here was with polling, we, and which is what's expected, right? Is if we're polling the device for completion, we should not be seeing hardware events, right? Hardware interrupts being generated for those completion events. So next, we're gonna take a look at uh, um, a couple of slides that um, basically drill down into uh, the kind of efficiencies that, that we are getting with IOU ring as far as utilizing the microarchitecture resources. Um, and the way we looked at this is we used uh, something called the top-down microarchitecture analysis methodology. Um, and if you're not familiar with it, we have a good link um, at the bottom there that talks, uh, I think it's a 50, 50 page white paper that talks, talks, it talks, gives a lot of details about this methodology. Um, but the, the, the key thing with the top down microarchitecture analysis method is um, it, it provides a structured way to basically analyze the performance bottlenecks uh, of the key function blocks of these out of uh, 
order execution microarchitectures. Um, and so we used this methodology. We looked at uh, some data at the level one. Uh, we looked at um, the, uh, you know, the percentage of time that's being spent retiring uh, instructions. Um, and then as far as the CPU pipeline goes, um, we looked at uh, uh, what's happening on the front end and the back end, right? So uh, the CPU pipeline can be broadly broken down as uh, into a front end and the back end. Uh, and on the front end, the front end is basically in charge of uh, fetching instructions, decoding them into micro operations, and then submitting them to the back end. And then on the back end, uh, the back end is looking at these micro operations, and as the operands for those micro operations become available, uh, the back end uh, uh, e executes those micro operations uh, and retires them. So as far as the, as far as the, uh, uh, the pipeline goes, we also have interesting data around uh, the, the TLB utilization, the cache utilization, uh, and we're going to take a look at that. So we started our analysis by looking at CPI, which is probably a metric that you're probably pretty familiar with, right? So we wanted to see, as we go from uh, uh, asynchronous, an asynchronous in our driven mode with libAIO uh, to, a, to, a, to a polling implementation with IO Euring, um, how does that change the cycles by instructions? And uh, what these numbers here are showing is, uh, with IO Euring, with batching, uh, that CPI, cycle spy instruction, uh, that dropped by over 60%. So we said, well, this looks really good. Uh, well, let's drill down a little bit more and look at uh, uh, what's really going on uh, at that level one of the microarchitecture. And that's what I'm sharing here. And the key, the key thing we noticed uh, is that green portion of those bar graphs and the, uh, I think that's orange portion. So the green part shows the, um, uh, the uh, percentage of time being spent retiring instructions. And what we see is as we go from uh, LibAIO to uh, IO Urine with batching, there's a 30% increase in the uh, amount of time being spent uh, retiring instructions. And then that orange part, uh, it's orange, uh, shows uh, how much time is being spent in a stalled state, right, waiting for something, right? And what we see is as we go from uh, uh, LibAIO uh, to IO urine with batching, uh, this 30, 30, approximately 32% less time being spent waiting for things, right, in a stalled state. So this, this sounds really interesting. We're like, okay, well, let's, let's drill a little bit deeper and see, you know, what's happening when, uh, 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 when what, what's, where, is the, where is this improvement in the amount of time being spent in that stalled state? Where is that coming from? And uh, this graph here has... Lots of bars, for sure. Um, it, the, the, key, the key theme, I think, that, that popped out right away is around instructions, right? Uh, especially ar around the uh, uh, instruction cache and the instruction TLB, right? Uh, going from LibAIO to IO Urine with uh, uh, polling uh, reduced the misses on the ITLB and the instruction cache. Uh, by over 60%. So that was the, the, the one that really popped out. But there are, there are a couple of other notable ones, right? You can see as far as branch load misses goes, uh, there's about a, almost 30% between, I believe, I, actually I think it's between 30 and 40% uh, decrease in the, in the misses there. Uh, as far as the uh, LLC uh, cash, uh, as far as load misses go, there's about 10% improvement. So basically, uh, what, what this is showing is IO Euring is more efficient in terms of utilizing the micro these microarchitecture uh, features like the caches, especially the, the instruction cache um, and, and uh, the LLC cache. And in case you're wondering about uh, the comparison with SPDK, 
Um, that's what uh, this chart here is showing. And the interesting thing is how the theme, that theme uh, on the instruction cache and the instruction TLB carried on, right? In, in, even when we were comparing IOU ring versus SPDK, right? We still see there's about a 90% reduction in the misses um, on the ITLB and the L1 cache. There are a couple of other notable ones. Uh, when we did the IOU ring comparison versus SPDK, uh, we see, we see a 90 over 90% reduction on the data TLB uh, cache. Uh, we also see over 90% reduction on that LLC uh, load miss. Um, and then the, the branch load miss, uh, that one's also significant. It's about 70 to 80%. That's 100% read, okay, right? This is 100% read, 4K, that's right. So the next thing that we're going to be talking about is some of the upcoming features as far as IOU ring goes. Um, so a lot of interesting uh, things coming down the pipe. Support for sockets. Actually, we were just notified that that's actually available today. So. Uh, it's not really upcoming anymore, it's available. Um, and then uh, support for RAID, right? RAID, uh, DM RAID and logical volumes, uh, that's, that's one of the interesting upcoming features. Um, and then as far as, uh, so, so we've shown that doing this asynchronous, uh, do, doing this, doing this uh, uh, asynchronous, IOs, or rather doing system cons in an asynchronous fashion, uh, clearly benefits uh, in terms of software performance, right? There's a clear benefit to doing that. So there's a lot going on looking at how, 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 how do we take this to more than just um, block, block IO, right? Is uh, this pattern of uh, opening, reading something, and closing, and doing that asynchronous, how, how can that be used elsewhere other than just in a block IO? And then to summarize basically our talk, um, basically you have, you now have a new high performance IO interface uh, in the Linux kernel that is going to be, avail that, that is available starting with the Linux kernel 5.1 uh, that eliminates a lot of the limitation uh, that you have with uh, LibAIO today. So if you're looking to build an application that uses that next generation of uh, storage media uh, with LibAIO, uh, you get lower software overhead, right? So if you have an application that's, uh, that, that is latency sen sensitive, uh, I'm sorry, with IO Uring, you get lower overhead uh, as far as the software is concerned when you're submitting and completing the IOs. Um, and then as far as the IOPS goes, uh, you get over a million IOPS without trying, and if you try a little bit harder, you get closer to two million. And that's the, uh, that's the end of our talk. So, the, the, graph, the, the chart that you were showing, uh -huh. for read, do you have any writes on, or mixed reads on writes? No, we didn't, we didn't collect any, uh, uh, any, any data for mixed workloads. But we have seen similar type of improvements. It's just that here we are showing the read. 90% improvement? Not like, not like uh, 90, but there are improvements for sure, even for writes. Please repeat the question so we can... So the question is that all the data that we shared is for 4K random reads, um, and he's asking if we looked at uh, uh, mixed workloads or write, writes. Uh, and, and the answer for that is uh, we don't have the data, uh, but I, I believe what Vishal was saying is we have looked at, we have looked at uh, some of those patterns, and you see similar uh, type of performance gains. Is there an interface or a similar set of tools that could be used from the kernel space? Is there an for for IO Uring? Well, or that that lowers interrupts, does the same performance optimization, but if you're trying to use block devices from a kernel space application, I, that's a funny term, but mm -hmm. you want to. You know, from a kernel thread, if I want 
do block I.O. Is, are there similar techniques that can be used to lower system overhead when you're coming from kernel space? So I.O. Uring, I believe, targets user space. And Christoph is here. He can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but so. I repeat my yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, just to make sure everybody got the question right. So the question was, what we're talking about mainly ap applies uh, to uh, user space application, right? Is uh, lib, lib Uring is enabling user space application to reap better performance using the techniques we, we just talked about. But his question was, if, you, if you're doing something in kind of space, is, is there something available uh, for you to do that? And I believe what Christoph said was, you don't really need uh, you're in the same context, right? You, do, you, don't, you don't need, definitely don't need lib um, And it looks like there are some things that you can do to, uh, to utilize the resources you have in, in that kind of space context better. Right. The, the things that he was saying, reusing memory allocations, we're doing those already. Okay. So, yeah, that's, that's just general code efficiency. Okay. Right? Okay. Go ahead. Are there any special considerations uh, if I want to set this up in a uh, remote socket scenario. Numa Yes, yeah. yes. So the question is Numa alignment, right? Um, I think I understand your question is if you have a system with more than one socket, um, what type of considerations uh, do you need in order to get that really good performance? Um, NUMA alignment for sure should be important, right? Is, is you, you definitely want to use cores on the same NUMA node as your devices, right? You want to avoid. Yeah. Okay. yeah. What was yeah, that? It's not particular to you, No, no, no. That's no. application. Yeah. 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 Any more questions? Uh, can you elaborate okay. on rate support? Um, other than it's not supported today? Yeah. No. When we need to support, what, uh, what, what meaning does it have? Apart from management, it's yeah? are you going to create volumes? Are you going to do tuning? I, you know. It, it, well, let me, let me ask it. Anyway, are you supporting specific pieces in RAID, or are you generally supporting device memory So, So today it's not supported, right? Um, I know, uh, Christoph, in your talk, uh, uh, you, you I, I don't think we have Jens here, but is there, do, you, do you know what the plan is, Christoph, for supporting RAID with the IOU ring? Uh, I, I mean, I, I think we're confusing two things. Because I mean, IOU ring perfectly fine everywhere. It's just a falling feature. Yes. Additional support from the driver's side. Yes. 
support for falling through remapping layers, but I think we only do it for very trivial ones. Like, like partition remapping, you can't blame check We don't know at this point. No, no, and, and actually that's a good point, right? Is, is you can use IOU in, in interrupt mode, um, which, which, which means you know all the features like RAID would work, but this is what we're talking about is uh, in polling mode. Um, that's that's where the RAID doesn't work. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah un unfortunately, I I don't have a, an answer for you right now on when that would be supported. Go ahead. Uh, uh, are there any like specific use cases where you would recommend that the two use higher? Um, so I think, okay, thank you. So this, so we, what we shared is basically an analysis of uh, different ways in which you can talk to uh, uh, block devices, right? Um, the, the, way, the way I look at this is, is, these are options that you have, you know, you're trying to build a solution, right? Uh, and you know, if you're looking at performance, uh, we're sharing the performance numbers that you, you see with the different ways in which you can talk to the, talk to the device. Um, but if, you, if, you, if you're trying to build uh, a solution, uh, there's probably a lot more going on than just what we shared uh, in terms of go out and use, or, or this interface is a better fit than that interface. So I'm not sure there's a generic answer to to, to your question. But sometimes right. your applications, um, if they just want to lie in the kernel space, you don't you don't want to like some application they don't want to completely go user space and still use kernel. I you using you know for faster and gaming I is there socket support in SPDK? I didn't think there was. So that would be a good example where IOU would make sense over SPDK. So, I mean, uh, and maybe some of this is confusion in terms of what SPDK is. So, SPDK is not trying to provide a socket interface. Right. That's so, exactly. so um, where SPDK is not an option at all. Exa exactly, right? I mean, once again, it goes back to what are you trying to build, right? If you're trying to build something that's using sockets, then. Can IOU ring be used to cut down user kernel transitions for? General file I/O, as opposed to block. Yes. The the definitely is support for uh, uh, file I/O. Yes. Okay. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. The data we shared though is is just for block. We don't have the uh, performance numbers for for file. But yes, early on in his in your slide, right? Thanks, Christoph. Any uh, any more questions? Thank you.